Okay, endocrine system. Uh, we're gonna do it. Um, so pretty quickly through this, um, endocrine system really focuses on the bigger picture of cell communication. How does it? <laughs> you guys have seen this before. Okay. Um, few reasons why it needs to happen. All of the above. Um, and evolution ties us together as things have evolved, their communication has evolved to become more specific, specific as well. Hopefully we remember that cell communication either happens inside of the body or outside of the body. Um, so outside of the body, pheromones are like chemicals, uh, quorum sensing we'll get to, inside the body, short and long distance, which gets into the endocrine system. Pheromones are chemicals, um, they serve a variety of functions, a lot of the time it's mating, Quorum sensing is basically releasing a hormone that allows them to indicate if they are near something. Um, so similar to pheromones, but it's for movement. Um, inside of the body, there's a bunch of different types, short and long distance. Long distance is always hormones, so that's nervous system mostly. Um, and then short distance, we have autocrine and paracrine glands. Sorry, um, long distance is going to be your endocrine system or like endocrine glands. Short is going to be paracrine and autocrine glands. Um, so direct contact communication, this does happen in plants. The cells are so sandwiched together that they communicate. Um, short distance is going to be paracrine cells. They just diffuse and impact the cells next to them. So it just moves by dif uh, diffusion. Um, Autocrine, hopefully the term auto tells us that uh, it, they release a cell and it um, just comes back to itself. And then long distance communication is signal transduction. Now that we've gone through all of these videos, we should see that this comes up a ton. Um, endocrine glands, so long distance signaling. They are chemical signals that are transported through fluids and they get to a target cell. Um, this kind of um, is a graphic organizer if you want to use it. I think that you used it before and you should be able to rearrange it like this. Um, communication features or basically steps. You have your secreting cell. It releases the signal. Um, it is going to head through some sort of bloodstream, usually, or fluid, to the receptor that is on the target cell. Um, so, overview of that. Um, so, getting into specifics, uh, the endocrine system is composed of all these glands that secrete hormones, and we know that this is going to be an example of long-distance signaling. Um, there's over 30 different chemicals that are used to maintain homeostasis and have certain body functions. Uh, there are nine major glands, and it works on a ductless uh, system, which is basically just into the bloodstream and to a certain place. Oh my gosh. Mm. Okay. Uh, knowing these would be pretty useful. Um, so there's two systems that coordinate this, the endocrine system and the nervous system. The endocrine system releases hormones that are longer acting, take a little bit slower. Um, nervous system sends high speed electrical signals uh, and they can release neurotransmitters. But once that happens, they can in turn um, cause the endocrine system to start up. Um, the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland are basically the crossroads between nervous and endocrine. If we look, we see that the uh, hypothalamus is like right at the top of my anterior and my posterior pituitary. The hypothalamus is specific to the nervous system. The two pituitary glands are specific to the endocrine system. Um, two hormones that are released by posterior, so in the back of the brain, uh, oxytocin, which releases, uh, which regulates milk secretion and stimulates the contraction of the uterus during uh, childbirth and also during menstruation. Antidiuretic hormone is going to be uh, in the kidneys, right? It makes you uh, keep more water as opposed to expelling more water. Uh, we can see that the hypothalamus has neurosecretory cells, which is a combination of 
neuron and secretory cells. Um, basically, it sends a message to the posterior pituitary and it will release one of the chemicals. Um, um, in the anterior or the forward pituitary, um, it's controlled by releasing and inhibiting hormones from the hypothalamus as well. Um, if we look, this is a large range of the hormones that are released. Um, follicle stimulating hormone is has to do with pregnancy and menstruation. Thyroid stimulating hormone has to do with the thyroid. Um, ACTH um, is adrenal hormones. Um, prolactin uh, produces like uh, lactose in the mammary glands. Melanocyte stimulating hormone has to do with pigments in your uh, like melanin. Uh, growth hormone growing. Um, so these are the different organs and oh, what they contain. Um, so thyroid regulation, it's what we call a cascade pathway. Um, they basically almost always involve negative feedback. And so we see is a cascade pathway is like one message is sent and then the next message is sent and so on. So if we look, we see that the blue at the top is technically part of the brain. It senses something going on. It sends a message to the hypothalamus, which is the nervous system. The nervous system is going to release um, a thyrotropin releasing hormone TRH into the bloodstream. It's going to head into the bloodstream and right into the anterior pituitary, which secretes thyroid stimulating hormone. Uh, gets into the bloodstream again, it uh, gets to the thyroid, and the thyroid releases T3 and T4, and then it goes to the body tissue. So we can see that this cascade to always um, multiple hormones that cause like the next hormone, and we get that um, feedback system going. Okay, um, so... This talks about the signal transduction pathway, reception, transduction, response. Um, there's a bunch of different types of uh, molecules that can function as the ligand, which is the, the message. Um, really, I'm not going to go much over this because we've talked about it so many times. Um, and we've talked about the different receptors that we'll see, uh, G protein linked, um, ion channels and the tyrosine kinase ones. Um, if you want to pause this and look at it again, do that. But we've talked about this a lot. Um, at least I believe we've talked about this a lot. Um, yeah, types of receptors, all that stuff. If you are very confused about receptors, please email me or ask me about this. Um, I'm not going to go into much detail because I feel like we've talked about this quite a bit. Okay, um, so this is talking about the difference between uh, water and lipid-soluble hormones, and really what that does is it de determines where the receptor is going to be. If we look, um, water-soluble hormones are going to link right up to the receptor on the surface of the target cell, whereas lipid-soluble hormones, uh, like steroids, are going to target signal receptors that are inside of the cell. Um, and so, um, right, so this talks about the opposite, the lipid-soluble hormones and how they have to go in. Um, lipid-soluble hormones are going to be like steroids and things like that. They need to get all the way into the cell for that to happen. Oh my gosh. Um, <clears throat> this is, <coughs> pause this, write this down. This is kind of a summary of everything that I just clicked through really fast. Don't stress so much about that. Know the difference between a protein hormone and a steroid hormone. That would be the key to getting a, um, a good answer on an open response or something like that. Um, know that hormones also have multiple responses. Different receptors for a specific hormone or different pathways will create a variety of responses. Um, the hormone epinephrine, for example, has multiple effects. Um, depending on where it is bound or where it ends up, um, it will have all different types of responses. This is just kind of talking about that. Uh, finally, talking about homeostasis in this communication, um, we know that um, to maintain a certain level, we always need um, like the homeostat homeostatic feedback to happen. Um, this is a simple hormone pathway um, with P 
pH in the duodenum, which is part of your large um, intestine. And we see that the response will then indicate whether or not that stimulus continues. If my pH is still imbalanced, I'm going to continue releasing the hormone. If it's not, I will stop. Um, something that is a really good way to think about this is um, if I give a person negative feedback, what's going to happen? I'm asking them to stop doing what they're doing. If I give you positive feedback, I'm saying keep doing what you're doing. And so the same thing works for um, signaling. If I say um, stop what you're doing, if I give negative feedback, it's stopping what happens. Uh, if I give you positive feedback, you're going to keep doing what you're doing. And so that is a really good way to remember it. Um, this kind of addresses what I just talked about. Examples of positive feedback, obviously uh, contractions, giving birth, oxytocin is continually released that if um, we know that contractions are happening, they're going to keep um, signaling that this should go on. Um, knowing the uh, insulin and glucagon feedback system, if you want to pause here, we've talked about this, right, that insulin um, is going to decrease blood glucose levels, glucagon is going to increase it because it either uh, reabsorbs sugar from the bloodstream or it puts uh, sugar back into the bloodstream. Um, we end up with diabetes if that's not the case. This uh, has to do with calcium in the bloodstream and in the bones. Um, again, functions similarly the same way, but um, the parathyroid stimulating hormone uh, deals with the kidney, the bone, and the intestines, depending on the level of calcium. Um, that will determine the uh, whether or not more is released or not. Um, yeah. So calcitonin is another example of that if you want to pause and look. And that is the end of the endocrine system review.